Welcome to the show. Today we are speaking to a graduated client of our 90 day stop drinking process by the name of Mike Powell. He is a 59 year old I guess you could say, I was about to say former Brit, but he's probably still a current Brit, <laughs> but he lives in Bellingham, Washington in the US of A. And as we're recording this today, he is currently 118 days alcohol free. He's currently a yacht rigger and formerly a sports photographer. He moved to the US when he was just 19 years old to photograph the NFL and then he created and built a company that he later sold to Getty Images. And we're going to learn all about that today. Mike Powell, congratulations on 118 days alcohol free. How are you feeling generally? Um, really good. Thank you, James. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's had a, a pretty big impact on, on my life uh, and how I go about my sort of day to day living, really. It's, uh, it's, it's great not even thinking about alcohol or rarely thinking about it uh something that used to be on my mind constantly throughout the day in, uh, in many days so it's nice to sort of get that weight off your shoulders and uh, move on with better things when you say alcohol was on your mind much of the day what do you mean by that um it was just a, a sort of a nagging thought at the back of my head uh, where I was going to have lunch would be determined on what I fancy drinking at lunch uh, I'd have a cocktail at lunchtime um, I'd finish my work day early to come home and, and have a drink or to go out and meet friends um, and that's that's all changed it does uh, it's not something I consider at all now um, I don't I don't have to feel bad about thinking about it and I don't have to um, sort of force myself not to think about it. It's just not there anymore. Whereby before the thought of having a drink would just pop into my head and always be just that sort of background thought. And that was one of the reasons I sort of got into this program is I just was sick of getting pushed around by it really it having so much influence on my life. How long had you realized that it had that much influence on your life? Well, I first downloaded your PDF and signed up for your emails six years before I actually called you. Is that right? Wow, <laughs> I didn't yeah, know that. I, I looked back on my emails and I actually the first ones I got from you were six years ago from when I started the program. It Incredible. took me that long. Incredible. Yeah. Wow. So... Probably it was on your mind even before six years ago. It was just that was the yeah. action you took six years ago, right? So yeah. why do you feel that it took you five and almost six years to finally take action and do something about it? And in this case, it was enroll in our Project 90 program and stop drinking. But why do you think it took you that long to take action? Um. I could, I think I convinced myself or, or the narrative that was in my head was I enjoyed it. It was part of who I was. Um, when I was a sports photographer, we constantly on the road and traveling and every night with clients or with other photographers was kind of a, a road trip party. Um, uh, I just, I didn't see what it was. I didn't, I didn't realize really what it was doing to me other than the obvious health effects until I actually cleared my head of it. So it, it, it's sort of that chicken or egg thing. It's like, what came first? My realization that I needed to get rid of alcohol or when once I did get rid of alcohol, the realization of how much effect it had on me. That was a big deal, actually. That was an eye opener is that looking back on some sort of you know big life moments or how I reacted to things and, and realizing as I look back that alcohol and had a big effect on how I reacted to a lot of different things. Um, but why I didn't do something earlier, I tried multiple times on my own. I tried doing the drink only at the weekends, drink only on a social event with other people, um, all of that. And it all just came back to me drinking on a daily basis. And I think, I think I made the final call and got on board because I was 58 at the time and I just felt like I had a lot of inflammation in my body. I've, 
um, I've done a lot of sports and have picked up quite a few injuries and I'm just trying to live the last sort of the next stage of my life in a, in a healthier way because the body doesn't hold up that well if you're drinking. And I was doing all these other kind of things that were good for my health. I used to be a racing cyclist and a climber and I always felt I was pretty athletic. So I, I kept up on my supplements. Um, I was trying to get my gut biome dialed in. And I looked to myself and I said, you, you're doing all this to try and be healthy while pouring alcohol on top of it all it just negates everything you're doing. So I sort of made this list of all these things I wanted to change in my life and all of them, basically the root of the, those issues I felt were, was alcohol. It was the one giant elephant in the room that I just couldn't get around. Sooner or later, I was going to have to admit that I'm just going to drink the rest of my life or I'm going to do something about it. Mm. What had you tried previously to curb your drinking and what worked for a while and what did you try that just ultimately didn't work? Um, the self-discipline weekends only thing. My weekends just got longer and longer. Um, and there was always an excuse to sort of break those rules. Um, I did talk to my GP and for a little while she tried me on um, nal naltroxone, I think. It's to help to stop um, cravings. And I used that a year ago when I stopped for about two and a half months or so. Um, but I felt the second time around when I did it, I didn't use any of that. Um, I sort of, did, I didn't feel it, it was that strong of an effect on me. Um, so really it was, um, where am I going here? The uh, self-discipline just didn't work. The pharmaceutical way of doing it only had a limited effect. You, you need a lot more surrounding you to support you to, to make this stuff, to make this um, quitting drinking stick. Take, it takes it takes what we what you have in the AFL program, you know the accountability, the people around you, and the and the um, and the uh, the counselling you get during the program. You can't just do it on your own. I don't believe. I, I know some people that have, but very very few. Mm. I always say that I feel that the five pillars that seem to make this alcohol free lifestyle project ninety process effective for those who go through it is or are the five pillars are coaching, accountability, community. Uh, what did I say there? Coaching, community, accountability, uh, skin in the game. Yeah. And then fun, the word uh, fun. Yeah. I have, uh, I have that written on the very first page <laughs> of, uh, of my book that when I started, this is this is my journey right here. And I literally that's at the very bottom of the first page. And it's and it's a process that works. Yes. It seems to work. It seems to have worked for you. It seems to have worked for the hundreds of folks who've gone through it as well. And I would submit that if you lose one of those pillars, mm -hmm. it it just is ineffective. Because if it's if it's not fun or I mean, not that stopping drinking is, is fun. No one really thinks about trying to stop drinking is fun. But we can make it, uh, I guess, um, we can reduce its unpleasantness, I guess, is a way of saying it, by being in a group of like-minded people and having a laugh now and then and not taking it so seriously. And, you know, I, I, this is not to dismiss that stopping drinking is a serious thing. But if we can implement some level of fun then it seems to just make the process go a lot easier. Was that your experience? Uh, yeah, the ha having the group, um, getting on the group calls for me was the, that was kind of like a pillar of me stopping drinking. Um, the Marco Polos, I really liked listening to them. I wasn't very good at making them. I did, I did a few, but I wasn't a, a, a regular in that, in that world. Um, the accountability and having that having really good um coaches and the people that i'm sharing that time being coached with has been great the breakout rooms where you're one-on-one -on -one with somebody 
um, they were always really open and 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 you know very healthy conversations. And I think that's that combination of sort of having the right group of people together that all have a similar goal and have all maybe had some kind of similar life experiences, having been successful in lots of parts of their life, except this one in particular that they're now trying to deal with. I think that goes a long way to, to make you feel comfortable in the group you're with. For those who don't know what Mike's referring to when he used the phrase Marco Polo. So Marco Polo was a video messaging group we have it's all private and confidential and our clients are able to send little video selfies to one another during their 90 days of stopping drinking with us and what it does is that it creates community which creates camaraderie which creates accountability which ultimately creates the breakthrough for most folks mike let's go back to the beginning i'd love to learn a little bit more about you because you are uh, a brit by birth um yeah. And I, knowing what I know about the British culture, it's very steeped in drinking. Now, there's a very heavy drinking culture there. So just tell us a little bit about where you grew up and how you first got brought into the world of, I guess, drinking. And then just, you know, share a little bit of a story about what you did professionally until you came over to the US. Yeah. Um, yeah so, Craig, I mean, in the UK, drinking's just, just not you know it's normal the pub scene um starting to drink in your early teens is 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 pretty common i mean i i remember being a boy scout and sneaking beers out to camp you know <laughs> and uh, probably probably get banned for that now but um but yeah so it's just part of your sort of it's part of just the day-to-day -day life there you don't even think about it being an issue until you sort of dig into it a little bit um and when I came to the States, I noticed there was less of a culture of drinking. Um, but on the other hand, I was traveling 250, 300 days of the year by this point. I I started working in sports photography when I was 16 as kind of an apprentice, um, moved over to L.A. when I was 19 um, and then really was just traveling nonstop since then. So um, I'd already picked up a fairly healthy drinking habit before I left the UK um, and uh, that's and it, at the time it didn't seem unusual it was just normal it's just what everybody did you didn't even think about it it was what you did to have fun uh, and that continued with me traveling so much it was uh, you know it was I call that the sort of the happy drinking phase later on after I stopped uh, traveling and I sort of moved out of the sports photography world I felt like it became a little bit sadder. The drinking continued, but it wasn't the party, so to speak. Um, but uh, the, um, the, yeah, the background in drinking was just there. I remember having drinks at, at family Christmases or, you know, having a, a small glass of wine when I was probably 11 or 12 years old and never, nobody even thought about it twice. Uh, the conversation I had with my kids about alcohol was very different. I don't think I even had one with, with my parents, but uh, my kids, I think by this point, I'd learned enough about alcohol and other things to realize that if I could just get them to hold off drinking as long as possible, they'd have less of a bad, a poor relationship with alcohol. I, could, I definitely saw people in the States that didn't drink until their mid-20s, had a very different relationship to alcohol and people like myself that started in our teens. Um, it's to them, alcohol was take it or leave it. To me, it was just part of every day. When you said you had a conversation with your kids, at what time of their life and what time of your life did you have those conversations? Um, they would have been probably just before they turned teenagers. Um, I was obviously still drinking at, at, at that time. Um, so it was really, uh, you know, don't do what I do, do what I've learned kind of thing. It's like my, my parenting skill has always been uh, showing them how, how not to do it. You know? I break my body on a regular basis. And, uh, and so I'm a bit of a crash test dummy. Uh, so really, it was it was like, look, take this from my experience. You don't want to be in this place later in your life and the way not to get there. And I know you're going to experiment with this. It's just hold off as long as you can, absolutely as long as you can. And, and your, your brain won't create these neural pathways 
to pleasure directly linked to alcohol. It can be something you can have a healthy relationship with if you can manage that. Um, but I couldn't. I think I just started too soon. When you said to your children, don't do what I do or you'll get to this place, what is the place that you were telling them that, that you'd got to? Um, essentially alcohol dependency. Uh, I didn't want to, I didn't want them to have to deal with that. It's, it was, it, it didn't seem that bad, but like I said earlier, it was like, once you stop drinking, you realize how much of an effect it has on your life. It probably affect, you know, I know it affected my relationship with my ex-wife. I know it probably had me missing some more of the subtle connections that you'd have with with my kids i mean i have a great relationship with my kids but i feel a lot better about it now that i'm not drinking and they both feel great about it as well and don't have a bad relationship with alcohol which i'm really happy to see they listened to you i'd i'd, I'd maybe in some ways yeah i mean kids do on occasion they might not be listening to you at the time but it does sort of stick in the back of their heads after a while and and i also think culturally that their current ages, they're both in their sort of early 20s. I think a lot of people uh, are not turning to alcohol the way we did in our generation. I think, I think things have changed a little. How old are your children now, Mike? Um, they are 21 and 23. So they could be 21 and 23 year olds who are drinking excessively. You've maybe just come out of college or in the middle of college now going to mm -hmm. fraternity parties. By the way, do they live in the US or do they live in the UK? In the US, yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah, so they're and, in Montana right now. Yeah. So they could be big drinkers by now, but by all accounts, or by your account, they're moderate, modest or moderate drinkers, yes? Yeah, very, yeah, moderate to light, I would say. Even, even though my son works at a brewery in Bozeman. You know, mm -hmm. but, uh, um, and it's, it's a big contrast because... Um, relatives of mine that have had kids. I remember going back to the UK and hanging out with um, with other part members of the family. And you'd hear them talking when they were going through their college experience, you'd hear them talking about what they did at the weekend and what, you know, what they're doing for their vacation and everything revolved around drinking. Um, and it was, that was an eye opener going back into that culture and just listening to how people that were in their twenties talked about drinking and it was still a, big heavy influence on them uh and that's kind of that was sort of a bit of a reflection in the mirror that i didn't like the look of mm. you referenced that you missed some of the nuance in communication with your children probably because of the effects of drinking and you referenced mm -hmm. that possibly your relationship with your ex-wife wasn't as uh, healthy as it could have been also right. in part because of your drinking would you just elaborate on that well, yeah. Um, when you're drinking, there's really not much space to to be sort of a, emotionally mature because you've you've blanketed your sort of your thought and your emotional reaction and and uh, and relationships in this sort of fog of um, of alcohol. So, understanding where you're at in a conversation or understanding where someone else is at in, a, in an emotional place, um, you don't see it. You, you, there's kind of an op opacity to your understanding, not only of their of their feelings, but also of your own. Um, I feel I felt really it's, I mean, I'm 59, but as far as emotional maturity, I think I've come a long way in the last hundred days um, because you start learning a lot more about yourself and you start seeing all those voids that, could have been worked on decades ago mm. so I, i'd say it's, it's mostly the opacity of of uh, mental clarity it doesn't allow you to to function at a at a higher level yes well that's tremendous self-awareness that you seem to have right now which maybe you didn't have back then absolutely yeah that's um that's what the eye opener was is you you think you're living you think you're living you think you are who you are and then you take that alcohol away and you realize there's a lot more there and a, and a lot of it really needs working on
you know, it's like you suddenly you sort of pull back the curtains and what you see isn't that great. It's like it's time to do something about this. Yeah, a lot of clients have shared with me that the 90 days, while they absolutely love the results, going through the process of identifying past mistakes or identifying behaviors mm -hmm. hasn't felt great. Uh, I use the analogy of that it can often feel like you're running through rose bushes, getting cut up by the thorns and you're all bloody. But then when you come out the other side, as many people do, possibly it could be on day 30, day 60, day 90, it could be day 120, you know, 30 days after you've completed your 90 days with us. It just, it's beautiful. I mean, there's still challenges, but compared to how you've been living life for in many cases, in your case, 59 years, it just seems so much easier and smoother. Was that your experience that even though you, you were feeling the physical benefits of not drinking, all of a sudden it shone a light on some of your, for lack of a better word, inadequacies, mediocrities, poor behavior? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, that ability to recognize these things which i think you'd sort of lose when you're drinking because that's your that's your first stop you know something's annoying you something's getting you down you're having a tough day with somebody your answer isn't to dig into that or hold fast and sort of weather the storm and talk it through and get to the other end your priority is to go and have a drink and forget about it so you, you just simply cannot mature in that environment um, which which makes everything a little um, life is more of a veneer as opposed to getting to the sort of the deeper stuff and and recognizing that in yourself like you said is isn't uh, isn't that fun and it's still an ongoing process to be honest because it's like when, once you recognize it then you've got to try and figure out what you're going to do about it and a lot of that you know we've been doing that work in the 90 days and, and in the beyond 90 um, but it's uh it's definitely a, a, a it's definitely a process and since going into beyond 90 um i think at some points i've had harder time in the last couple of weeks than i did during the last 90 days um i've been super busy haven't been able to make the calls the way i did on the 90 days maybe not as dedicated to it and i realized how much those calls were kind of an island for me to jump from one you know to do, do one of those coaching calls, two or three days being in a great place and then get to the next coaching call. You miss, you know, if I miss them for a week or so, you st I feel I start sort of rolling back a little bit and I have to catch myself. So it's, it's, not, a, uh, it's not something you can just like do and forget about. It's a continuing process. Yeah, for many people, you don't get to 90 days alcohol-free and feel like you've arrived. In fact, many people say, their day 90 often feels like it's their day one because it's great you've got to 90 consecutive days alcohol-free. It's great that we've, uh, in most cases, almost all cases, managed to rewire <clears throat> excuse me, your mindset around alcohol, mm -hmm. but you're still left with you, right? You're still left with dealing with all of the stuff that you haven't dealt with over decades, and that yeah. can mean or show up as trying to repair relationships with people that you may have fallen out with. It's questioning choices that you've made in career. Mm -hmm. It's uh, looking at your finances. Maybe it's looking at how many years you got left on this earth and like trying to decipher what you want to do with it. And a lot of people come up with lament about the past and uh, they have to kind of rewire their mindset again to get focused on what, are, what do you get to create from this point of view? Um, was there a, a noteworthy, significant breakthrough or observation that you have encountered since you stopped drinking either in project 90 or beyond 90 that maybe wasn't specifically related to alcohol but was related to something that only appeared to you because you were alcohol free definitely yeah um <clears throat> couple of big ones i think uh there was definitely there were definitely some aha moments throughout the process but one of them is um, when I was going through a divorce, I'd go and see a counselor uh, who was very good up here. And he always talked about the narrative in your head and how if you have one narrative in your head that's negative or a story that you don't want to happen, you've got to replace it with another one. Um, and leading up to 
Project 90 and the years leading le the years before it while I was drinking, I had this reoccurring nightmare of some kind. It was a daydream, but it was it was just a, it was a, really a, a, a an image of me sitting in a small apartment on my own, getting old, with a blanket over my lap, TV right in front of me, like five feet away, like just staring at this TV with a bottle of scotch next to me. And that was my that was my future vision. That's who I saw me becoming if I continued the way I was going. And that came and went, but it was always this one little story that kept bugging me. And then going through the 90 days, you rewire those stories. You, you, you open the doors. What you get through is I don't get that. That story doesn't pop up in my head anymore. What I've found is all these doors that Project 90 has just cracked open just a little bit. Hasn't led me down some great path to a, you know, a brand new life, but it's just cracked open these doors that are far more interesting to me than the one that I was telling myself before. So that was huge, really, because the story I had in my head was horrible existence. And that I'm sure was a lot of the reason that drove me to pick that phone, phone up eventually and, and, and give you a call. Because uh, I didn't want to be that person. Uh, I wanted to enjoy, you know, going into my 60s and still sort of living with abundance of some kind. Um, the other one, I think, looking back, um, I think alcohol had a lot more to do with uh, me getting a divorce than I ever thought it had done. Because I recognized how, um, how shut off I was from my own emotions and understanding the emotions of the people I was the, my ex-wife um looking back on that i'd say yeah that was a big regret but i also feel like i'm you know too late in that environment but uh, i feel like as a as a person i can make myself uh, a lot more um emotionally open and more um in tune with other people's feelings as well you know to actually as i said have some kind of emotional um maturity coming along and i and i've done a few things with regards to that talking to my kids even writing a letter um but uh it, it was sort of a that sort of that part of the self-discovery finding the things you didn't like about yourself that you could have done something about years beforehand that was that that's kind of hard to swallow but what's the op the option is to go back to drinking and forget about it not even try something Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that, Mike. You referenced you wrote a letter. Did you send it? Oh, yeah. It was mostly an apology for who I was. How did that feel writing the letter? Um. That's a tough one to answer because it took me. It, 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 I understood I needed to write it at some at some point during the during the ninety days. It become an, it became an overwhelming need to do something to like to recognize that I needed to stand up and sort of um, accept the responsibility of what of how I had been and just to uh, apologize for how I could have been a much better person and how I, uh, I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't the husband that I could have been. And I think drinking had a lot to do with that. Uh, so really, uh, you know, I wrote it as much for me as, as, as for my ex, and I don't even know if she read it. Um, I hope so, and I hope she took it um, as being sincere. But, um, yeah, I, I suppose it was... Yeah, it wasn't easy. And thinking back on it, 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 it still isn't, but it was also a, a big weight. It's, it's one of those moments where you feel like you can't turn back from that. Once you sort of, it's like you're confessional, you, you've, you've, you've laid it out on the table. How can you be, go back to that person that you've been when you've seen how much damage it's done? Well, I acknowledge you for your bravery in doing that, Mike. And it sounds like it was a healing process for you, even though it probably felt incredibly challenging in the process of it mm -hmm. um, 
you know, it shows tremendous courage. I salute you for that, sir. Well, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, it's if someone else can get ahead of that curve, then sort of me telling those story, that story, you know, could help somebody make the change in time to do something about it. Have you spoken to your children about you stopping drinking and what has their been experienced? What has their experience been of you since you stopped drinking, at least what they've conveyed to you? Right. Uh, yeah, I was very open with them from the moment I signed up, basically. Um, I wanted to talk and talk with them about it, uh, explain what I was doing. They under they understood. I mean, that you know, they grew up with me drinking. So they, they could see when I was shutting down and being less social and less part of the family. And that usually revolved around having a drink. Um, so they've been really su super supportive. Uh, and I and I think in some ways it probably reinforces that earlier story of, of not having a poor relationship with alcohol or any, any relationship. So I think um, talking to them about it was as much... Um, to let them know that I was doing something, uh, but also to say, look, you know, if you continue, if you go down the road of alcohol, you will most likely find yourself in this place too. So, you know, here's another reason not to do this. It's part of my parenting styles. I explained earlier, I go try all the bad stuff first and then tell them what not to do. <laughs> <laughs> we referenced at the beginning of uh, our conversation that you're now a yacht rigger. Could you explain to us what a yacht rigger is and does and what's the culture around drinking in the yacht community? Um, well, it's, yeah, after I sort of came out of drop out, not dropped out, I retired from the uh, photography world. The industry had changed dramatically and uh, I was looking around for something new to do. Uh, I got into sailing, mostly racing sailboats uh, as a, you know, usually race things to get better at it because that's where the that's the that's your first the fastest learning curve. Whatever you do, go find the guy that races it. <laughs> um, and so I ended up putting together two skills that I had: one from racing yachts and knowing how to tune a rig. So what you do with everything that keeps the mast up right on a sailboat has a lot to do with how well it performs. That's kind of like tuning your engine. Um, so I had that background. Plus, I'd been a lifelong climber. I used to climb all over the world like high altitude stuff in alaska or big oars in in yosemite and so working at altitude or upper mass was quite comfortable for me so i sort of i sort of put two and two together and just created a business out of those two skills and it's been three just over three years now and it, this is my retirement business which has turned into a bit of a industry at the moment <laughs> um but being in the sailing sort of yachty racing world and drinking is, or, and not drinking is really hard. That's what broke me last time. When I was sort of two and a half months into it, I was on a long race around uh, um, Vancouver Island up here in the Northwest. And I just, I just gave myself permission to start drinking again. Every time you cross the finish line, the bottle of rum would come out. We'd all pretend to be pirates. And, <laughs> and I just fell back into it. So I feel now, having with, gone through the program, that I have the tools necessary not to go back into that. I mean, I can hang out in that world, but I don't feel I, I have the need to drink or to feel like I have to fit in in that world. I'm quite comfortable. In fact, I quite like the fact that everyone knows I don't drink and they don't hassle me about it. And in lots of ways, they secretly whisper it to me later on. It's like, oh, I'm really impressed with what you're doing. It's like, oh, just to let you know, I've been cutting back. You know, you've inspired me. Or um, it has a knock-on effect to people around you. That they, they see what you're doing. They see how your attitude has changed. You're sort of a happier person. You, you don't get affected by small things as easily. You don't go into that anger mode so quickly. You can just... You, you just see the problems coming at you and you can sit with them a little bit before you react and, and then take care of the problem as opposed to the problem comes at you, you get all angry about it and pissed off, you ignore it and you go and have a drink. So, so it's that they're, they're all interwound there. 
Um, so I think um, I think people see that the attitude change and they they enjoy it and they you know they then take a little look at themselves. What, what they do with that is up to them. I'm, I definitely don't proselytize, um, but I just try and live my life and they and they see it improving, and uh, that that then gives them a, you know gives them pause to think. If you went on a a race right now and you guys came first and you crossed the fish finishing line and they all the rum came out and the celebration came out and you'd been at sea for a week or so mm -hmm. how do you suspect you might feel in that moment now with the benefit of you know being 118 days alcohol free what do you think that you still might feel some temptation and you'd still choose to be alcohol free do you worry that you might accept the invitation to drink the rum do you feel like no i'm good i can just celebrate without it like how do you feel that that what what do you think might happen if that scenario happened um, i think at some points i mean if it was to happen right now it wouldn't concern me i'd, I'd be able to walk straight put through that one and with that but you know as the season goes on or conditions change there might be a day where you I, I would consider having that drink, but that's when you then sort of have to draw on those tools that we've been taught. Um, doing the future casting. It's like, if I take this drink now, how will I feel about myself, you know, tonight or tomorrow morning? Or how will the people that know I don't drink think about me? Because fear of failure is a huge one and how people see you and they know you don't drink and there you are having a drink. It's like, well, what happened there? That feels like... That's, you know, that, that sort of, the fear of failure is a strong motivator, um, but ha just having the tools to not have to go back to that place, uh, I think, uh, I think I'll get through this season fine. Uh, and it'll, it'll be some days it'll be a piece of cake and other days I'll have to think about it a little harder. I'd like you to, I'd like to invite you to, to scroll back through the alcohol free lifestyle podcast of where, uh, this conversation is taking place now actually about December of 2022 and you'll find an episode there that's entitled widower sails across the ocean in dedication to his wife okay. and there's a fellow Brit by the name of Christian a little bit older than you Mike yeah and the episode and the interview and the conversation that I had with him back in December of 2022 was him detailing how as a tribute to his late wife, he learned how to sail, joined a sailing team, and they sailed from the west coast of Africa over to the Caribbean in a competition. And they came, I think, second in their class. And he was at sea, I think, 21 days or 21 nights. Mm -hmm. And he got off and he'd gone through Project 90. He'd gone through the program and everyone was celebrating with alcohol and rum, just like you described there. And he very happily remained alcohol free, returned to his quarters or his room that night uh -huh. and just felt incredibly fulfilled about what he'd just accomplished and didn't lament the fact that others were celebrating and drinking etc around him uh, and I think you might just find a lot of um, inspiration from that and just to tell the story further along because as we're recording this now it's you know May of 2024 Christian remains alcohol free I've caught up with him twice in London. He lives between London and Cheshire, which is south of Manchester in the north of England. Uh, he came to dinner uh, in a hotel restaurant with me and another former Project 90 member by the name of Evan Melcher, who's been interviewed on this podcast as well. And we had a wonderful dinner, just the three of us. And he was talking about how life had just changed so much for the better uh, and increasingly so with each month that he remained alcohol free. So I just invite you to have a listen to that because he's a fellow Brit. He's a fellow salesman. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, he's two years down the line from you. And I think you could garner a lot of inspiration from him and his story. No, I appreciate it. Uh, definitely. Low. And sort of going back to that support, like having someone that's two years down the road from me with similar outlooks I, I, I noticed how important that was to me when I was in the 90 day program in, in project 90 is the people that were nearing the end of it or the people that came in on the weekends for the beyond 90, they were inspirations because they, they, they knew they had that advice. They'd had that experience of going through this. 
Uh, and I had a really a, a great experience myself on my 90th day. I was put in with a fellow that was on day one. Uh, and we had 10, 15 minutes. In fact, I think, yeah, the call went on. It was like a one-on-one -on -one for almost 20 minutes because something weird happened to the rest of the call. But we chatted on and off and you could tell he was just, he was in a rough place. He was, he was struggling with the first day. I don't think he'd not had a drink for a long time. And I kept in touch with him on and off since then. And it's and it, it feels good to then be kind of able to pass that on because you're, you know, you, you bring people on that are four, five, six years alcohol free, they give me inspiration. And it's nice to be able to turn around and uh, pass that down the line a little bit as well, because that really helps. Just like you're doing right now by sharing your story in this conversation, I appreciate you doing that, sir. Uh, just finally, I'd love to ask you what you feel life could look like for you a year down the line and five years down the line, should you choose to remain alcohol free and bearing in mind, you've probably got goals, you've got a vision, maybe there's still some tough stuff to come because you just shared recently the last couple of weeks have maybe felt a little unsettling in certain, certain ways. So it's again, it's not like you've arrived. It's a process. But what what could life look like for you in a year and five years from now if you chose to remain alcohol free? Okay. Um, I'd say one thing, a place I've been in sort of since after the divorce and getting into this program uh, has been one of sort of, I feel like treading water. I used to be very, very goal orientated. I'd see something, I'd plan for it, I'd move towards it, I'd accomplish it, I'd move on to the next plan. That was kind of how my life was and how I ran it. And, and I felt like I was sort of cut adrift a little bit and was just treading water because I didn't really have any major plans. I mean, I did start a new business, but as far as grand goals, which I always seem to have or have had, where I'm at now is I feel like I'm not treading as much water and I'm starting to make those plans and, and, and sort of rebuild who it is I'm going to become, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, you know, one of my priorities is to deal with a bunch of orthopedic issues. I used to race dirt bikes and bicycles and rock climb and mountaineer and do all these things. So my body's had a beating. You know, it's like mind of a 12 year old body of a 90 year old i think um so like this year i'm uh, i'm getting a bunch of work done on my i'm going uh, getting stem cells plugged into my blown up achilles and my knees and uh i'm trying to get myself physically to a point where i can then make plans to go do other things so i feel like i'm in a rebuilding phase at the moment if anything else i don't have any grand plans other than sort of really just work on myself a little bit, read some of these books that Sarah has been, um, one of the coaches has been uh, uh, getting us to read and, and and just kind of actually just work on me for a bit, physically and mentally, and, and sort of try and fill out some of that sort of newfound cl clarity of thought and, and use it. But if, if anything, I also know that if I'd been drinking, I'd be treading water the rest of my life. Stopping drinking, now it's just a, a is now it's a, just a matter of what my choice is going to be what it is i'm going to do well said sir mike thank you so much for sharing your experience with us and uh for going there and being vulnerable and uh, like i said earlier i acknowledge you for your courage and sharing writing the story not just writing uh, sorry sharing writing the letter not just writing the letter uh, because I know that someone out there is listening right now who feels incredibly inspired by you doing that. So again, thank you. You're welcome. I'm glad I could share. Yes. And to you, the listener, thank you so much for sharing some time with us today. And we will catch you on the next one.